Now, there is a, a, a drug that's been very heavily st uh, studied, and we're eagerly awaiting news at the time of this recording about whether it'll be FDA approved for anemia in MDS, and that's loose patercept. Now, uh, again, Rami, you were instrumental in the development of this class of drugs here in the U.S. Um, do you want to comment on the Metalist study and, um, and uh, the, the results and, and where you feel like it fits into our, the treatments we've discussed? Sure, absolutely. So, uh, again, I think, uh, as you mentioned, like, there is excitement that hopefully we'll have the next drug in MDS approved for our patients. We didn't have any since, uh, like, 10 years approval of Glenn, probably. So it's really, hopefully, something that's going to be helpful for the patients. You were part of the studies as well. Uh, so, so those agents, plus Patercept, uh, they, they are termed now as erythroid maturating agents. They, they work on, you know, terminal erythroid differentiation. What they are, they are like fusion trap proteins that will neutralize the ligands of TGF beta pathway that ended to be important in MDS being overactivated, contributing to cytopenia. And some of those ligands, like namely GDF11, seems to be negative regulators of terminal erythroid differentiation. So those drugs will neutralize that. Uh, originally, they were tested in healthy volunteers. Toxicity was erythrocytosis, which is very welcomed in MDS. <laughs> right? So we tried to Thank get it. Thank you for that <laughs> right. toxicity. And, and the study went through, like in, in our colleagues in Germany conducted the original phase one, phase two study. In those, there was like a signal that responses may be higher in patients with lower risk MDS in a ring syndroblast subtype. So the medalist study was designed to, you know, include that population. So those were lower risk MDS patients that had ring syndroblast that were transfusion dependent. They randomized two to one fashion to get either lospatercept, uh, which is an injection every three weeks, subcutaneous. Uh, versus placebo. And the primary endpoint was transfusion independence at 24 weeks, but they also looked at 48 weeks. And the results were positive. Uh, the transfusion independence rate were in the range of 30%, uh, 36, 37% probably with the Lusbatter set versus 13% in the placebo, going back to the point that yeah. you mentioned earlier, that sometimes our thresholds for transfusion change once we put patients on trials, or there could be other reasons for, for bleeding. But nonetheless, the study was positive in terms of transfusion independency. Uh, and the 48 weeks also the same. And interestingly, when you look at subset of patients that were not heavily transfusion dependent, less than four units every eight weeks, or those patients you know, where we looked at objective response of hemoglobin increase of one and a half gram or more, uh, more than 50%, originally 69% of the patients in that population achieved the hemoglobin increase more than 1.5, which for me is always objective sign that it's not just transfusion reduction, that you are seeing you know, some effect on the hematopoiesis. Um, uh, the treatment is relatively well tolerated, fatigue, uh, uh, some general side effects, really no major f uh, you know, f uh, side effects with it. Uh, at least so far, no signal of increased you know, progression of M to MDS to higher risk MDS or AML or fibrosis on the bone marrow. At this year, I think we're gonna hear the update uh, on, on the results, what's available in the abstract data that basically, when they looked all through the study, the responses were higher, obviously, like almost 48% of the patients achieved transfusion independent with this patercept. And they used this principle of looking at different time periods of eight weeks or more, because some of the shortcomings of the response criteria, if you know that you, you, you record the longest duration of transfusion dependence only one time, but there are patients that will go 12 weeks and then just get one blood transfusion and then go another 12 weeks not needing transfusion, but the criteria do not recognize that. So they tried to look at this, and when you look at the, the lump of those, there are patients that went more than almost 90 weeks in, 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 in periods where they had transfusion independency. So I think the data is exciting. Uh, again, the indication or the approval will be ring sidroblast, lower risk MDS. I think down the road there could be implications testing this outside that setting. You know, in the original studies, any patients with splicing mutations were responding. There could be responses in non-splicing mutations. There are efforts obviously doing it in combination and all that stuff down the road. Uh, but hopefully it will be a new option for our patients. So. Yeah, I hope so. I, we did. Uh, I don't know if you've had experience using the drug, Alan or um, Jamil. No, I haven't. Not yet. It's. Not yet. I mean, it's. It, it's a shot. It's every three weeks. Um, it was in patients who either um, stopped responding or didn't respond to an ESA or didn't really have a good chance of responding to an ESA who were transfusion dependent. So I would. I personally would envision this as starting an, an erythropoiesis stimulating agent like erythropoietin or darbopoietin first. Um, and then 
when that stops working, it always stops working. When mm -hmm. it stops working, or if it doesn't work, then trying loose pattern sept. Mm -hmm. um, you know, transfusion independence response rate of 37% is generally better than what we see for other treatments for MDS. My um, personal experience, side effects were manageable. Um, and then moving to other other therapies. And it's going to be a very good uh, option for patients who may be ineligible, intolerant, or or even refractory to yeah. um, you know, so if we stimulate the agents, because this was the patient population in which the drug was studied. On a different note, like with um, the, uh, some of the data that were presented uh, relative to mutational profiling and what is the difference between those who responded and didn't respond, I found it very interesting with the Platzbecker abstract that's uh, presented at ASH, um, talking, because obviously most of those patients had brain sideroblasts, so almost nine, over 90% had SF3B1 mutation, and the variance allele frequency was rather high, like you're talking about 40%. So what was the difference between the two? And it seems as though the mutational profile didn't really matter between those who responded and those who didn't. And, 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 and again, it's very interesting to see that uh, responses will occur irrespective of what you might find on NGS. Now, again, maybe long term will be a little bit more helpful in that sense, but uh, it's comforting to know. Right. Yeah. Well, maybe just working on a completely different pathway than you know what we're we're looking for in the NGS, you know, sequencing. Maybe what's what's going on there. You know, uh, the NGS sequencing when I first started doing NGS sequencing was seven genes. Then it went to fourteen genes. Then it went to you know. Then it went to twenty some genes. Now it's 40, then it went to 44 genes, and now our institutional panel is 55 genes. So, you know, we, we're not covering, you know, everything that we may need to know, and, you know, I'm expecting that 100 gene panel to be the next, mm -hmm. my word, panel, as we incorporate more mutations that might be involved in these pathways. Which, which gives opportunities for therapy.